more gratifying than a two-man standing ovation. God bless you. Sir. It's a great pleasure and a great fun to be here. I'm sorry for the delay. It was my problem. I've never heard this before in my life. Technical delay. Beard rub on the microphone. I'll do my best to make it up to you. Uh, how, how are you folks all right? Yeah. On a medical note, thanks a lot, Canada. <laughs> uh, I have a couple of things to uh, explain. First of all, the hat. I'm going to take the hat off in a second. I need to explain to you why I'm wearing a hat. Uh, I'm guessing we have parents in the house, yeah. right? Yeah. Parents. Kids, right? Okay, so you have little things, little celebratory, symbolic things you do routinely as a family. In, in my house, when my kid is done with school for the summer, he shaves my head. Oh. Yeah, it's like Christmas, right? Harry? Yeah, Harry. That's, oh my God, maybe Harry's here. Uh, so that's what this is going to be, and I'm going to take it off, and I just don't try not to gasp, all right? <laughs> There you go. Cool. Yeah. Fresh out of Rikers Island. Uh, and a lot of people have said when they, when uh, I was lucky enough to be involved in this, people have said, oh crap, why is he involved in the Tribeca Film Festival? I'll, I'll tell you right now, and this ought to shut up the naysayers, since 1986, ladies and gentlemen, get ready. I have lived in Tribeca. Uh, this this guy who is here tonight. Did you know? You know who uh, Jane told you. Uh, this is this is wonderful. Uh, this man and I share some life experiences. It's no secret. Well, maybe it is that he and I are both from uh, Indiana. Uh, And uh, he spent time with my mother, and, I, and I'll ask him about this. I believe my mother, actually, uh, he took her for a motorcycle ride. But, she, you know, she's 94. I mean, she was then. She's no longer 94. Bummer, right? Uh, and then the other thing, when I was a kid, uh, and, and this is another coincidence that I have with Mr. Mellencamp. When I was a kid, my parents every year would work long and hard to save enough money every summer to make sure I got to attend the melon camp. <laughs> That's about what I expected, but not as much as I had hoped for. Uh, everybody ready? So uh, I'm going to put together an introduction, and when he comes out, please do your best to go nuts, all right? <laughs> this, this man, member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> now, whoever is making that whooping noise, get it out of your system. <laughs> all right, once more, man, let's hear it. Roll Hall of Fame, member of the uh, Songwriters Hall of Fame, Grammy Award winner, a uh, uh, humanitarian, a musical icon. You know him, you love him. Ladies and gentlemen, John Mellencamp.
this. <laughs> and I'll sit there and watch. Well, it's a big night, John. Thank you very much for including me in this. I, I appreciate it. It's great to be here. Hell, at my age, it's great to be anywhere. <laughs> We're the same age, Dave. <laughs> We're in the same decade, more or less, yeah. Uh, I want to start. Last night, I went to the Beacon Theater to see John in. <laughs> Well, you announced it as a performance, not a concert. What, what is the difference? Um, I don't like playing outside. I don't like playing with in front of drunk people. And I don't like people screaming and yelling in really quiet session. So about I mean, 10, 12 years ago, much to my manager's uh, disheartening, I said I'm not playing outdoors anymore, and I'm not playing arenas anymore. Mm -hmm. Play in theaters, <clears throat> and as I started playing in theaters, I realized that I could do, be more myself and do, you know, quiet songs and stuff, and try to relate to the audience on a different level than that's ah, get drunk and crazy mm -hmm. because you know we're fucking too old for that shit. Did you hear that, man? <laughs> <laughs> Well, so she's sober in doing that. <laughs> okay, here's what I want to tell you about Dave. I had been there with his mother a couple times, and his mother talked a lot, and she would tell me stuff. Now, I don't know if this is true or if Lebanon wants to hear this or not, but here's the story his mother told me on Dave one night at dinner. She goes, oh, wait a minute, you had dinner with my mother? <laughs> <laughs> and at your home? Yeah. How did that happen? You were invited, but you didn't fucking respond. Yeah, that doesn't sound like me. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly what I did. <laughs> wow, well, thank you very much. So anyway, his mother comes over, and she was, was she living with some guy? Uh, her husband. <laughs> Was the other guy, guy was later. Yeah, but, but that wasn't your dad. No, that, that was the, her second husband, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Where'd your dad go? What did he do? And where did he go? He's dead. <laughs> Let's go in some place. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, she comes over and she's saying, well, you know, I'm so happy. And I don't know if this is true, Dave, but this is what your mom told me. She said, I'm so happy, she goes, because Dave is working at a local television channel. What channel was it? Channel 13. Channel 13, he was the weather guy. Yeah, weekend weather guy. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, there's a position. <laughs> Heartbeat away from the regular weather guy. <laughs> but his weather was funny, so people watched him because he added a bit of humor to it. So I was talking to his mom and I said, well, how did Dave happen to go to Los Angeles, and she goes, well, really, it's you, she pointed to me, it's you, it's you that convinced him to go to Los Angeles, I, how did I do that, she goes, because Dave came in one day and said, there's a fucking kid from Indiana who's got a record deal, I'm going to Los Angeles, and if he can do it, I can do it. <laughs> for me was the transformative power of live music. Oh my God, it blows right off the stage and, and changes whatever you're in for, for that period of time. It was delightful. Thank you. Thank you. I believe uh, I saw you smoking at the beginning of the show. Yeah. Right. And I saw you kind of put it out on one of those deals. And then later I noticed you seem to be chewing gum. Now, am I correct about both things? Well, the reason I'm chewing gum is because of Canada. <laughs> because
because it's small. Oh, it keeps your throat. It keeps your throat wet. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, I still smoke cigarettes. In yeah. fact, I found out before I was on stage, I can't smoke up here. So I'm smoking. But, I, but you always let me smoke on your show. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, he encouraged that. I remember a couple times he was like, <laughs> you know, it was like nobody was smoking on television anymore. Dave was like, you want to smoke? Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It was just that kind of show. <laughs> I will, you know, the thing that I remember about your appearances on the show, I would say hello to you in the wings just before you were going to come on, and you smelled of fresh we smoked tobacco, and it was such a luxurious scent that I I wondered where the cigarettes came from. They had to be British. Am I close? Now they're called American spirits. <laughs> close. But they, they smelled great. Yeah, well, yeah, um, but, you know, when I did your show, I would, you know, the, the dressing rooms were small, and I would smoke in the dressing rooms, and the smoke yeah. just get all over everything. Yeah. Now, we, we've had other music acts on where the smell of smoke was completely different. <laughs> it's legal today. Uh, but, but so anyway, I'm sitting there watching the show, and actually not sitting, I'm standing. Everybody is standing through the whole thing. And I thought, here's a kid smoking and chewing gum. If this were high school, he'd be sent to the principal's office. <laughs> Dave, I'm very familiar with the principal's office. <laughs> <laughs> I was at the principal's office a lot more than I had my parents wanted me to do. Now, uh, this brings me to uh, another question about, uh, and I, I love this question, but what kind of a kid were you? It's just, uh, quite honestly, Dave, there probably wasn't that much difference between you and I. Were you ever arrested? <laughs> Nor was I. <laughs> no, I never was arrested. And in Seymour, small town. Right. Yeah. What was? We weren't a farm kid, though, right? No, no, no. My dad was uh, vice president of Robbins Electric, which was located in Indianapolis, and they built, uh, you know, like the Houston Astrodome and mm. Disney World. Stuff. So this is a, a big deal global corporation then. Well, it was until the guy that owned it himself shot himself. <laughs> Two. Two strokes. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> um, and, and your mother, uh, Marilyn, uh, runner-up Miss Indiana. Yeah, yeah, and she was, I think she was Miss Indiana University also. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, she was, a, my mom was, a, you know, kind of an attractive woman. Yeah, I guess. Now, what does that do to a kid? I mean, were you aware of that? I was just mom, right? Yeah, I also have guys come up and go, oh, I'd like to go out with your mom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. And I would always go, yeah, there she is. Go ask her. Go ask her. Uh, all right, so you're a kid. Uh, I remember the first music that got my attention as a kid. What was the first music that got your attention as a kid? I was lucky my parents were young. And uh, my dad's only 20 years older than me. And so I grew up, you know, listening to, to Woody Guthrie, oh, dad, that my parents thought they were hit. My dad had bongo parties, you know, and I would be a little kid and be bong, 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 you know, and I'd be in bed and him and his buddies would be playing along with like, you know, Gene Krupa or you know, somebody like that. So I, I was, you know, indoctrinated into music very early. Yeah. Uh, my music indoctrination early was all the classical music. My, my father was a member of some RCA record club and once a month he'd get a blue label uh, classical music stuff. So that's the music that I remember hearing until uh, I heard one night on the radio, a Heartbreak Hotel, Elvis Presley. And then that was like, oh, geez, I didn't realize we had another room in this house. It was crazy. <laughs> yeah. That opened the door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know about you, but I would always go to sleep with the radio on because at night in Indiana, you could, if you turned around on the radio, you could actually get Texas. Mm -hmm. And you could get Chicago. Get Chicago. You could also get WABC. Yes, you could. It, it, on certain nights. Yeah. So, 
more that we had in common. We both know that. That we had to kind of fish around on your little AM and FM had just started. Now you guys know the difference between AM and FM. <laughs> well no, AM sends signals like this. Boom, 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 boom. And the signal but, excuse me. Amplitude modulation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and next thing you know, Casas will be up here in the ass. Yeah, he like takes over everything. <laughs> now the reason Bob said that, but one, one of the reasons that Bob just I and I just did a huge interview. Where was that at, Bob? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, what the hell are we doing here? <laughs> I love to say, Dave, before you get to the Yeah, it's on PBS, and it, and it doesn't come out for much, like the other nine years. <laughs> back, to, back to FM. And FM signal goes like this. It goes in a wave. So, yes. Frequency modulation. <laughs> I can tell you where he learned this. Ball State. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm sure that he took broadcasting technology classes. Yes. And that's where you learn that yes. stuff. Yeah. And, and this is the first time I've had to invoke it in public. <laughs> <laughs> it finally came to hand. <laughs> uh, so anyway, back to the, the uh, performance last night. Uh, I, I can't overstate the e emotional uh, response or feeling in that room, the energy. And I'm thinking, as a guy who's written all of that music, with the exception of one, I, I think there was the uh, Gloria, that, that was uh, Van, Morrison. Van Morrison. Yes, but everything else, and these musicians, unbelievable. Now, how long does it, this is like a 76 stop tour, am I right, 76, 78? Something like that. Yeah, something like that. So were they, you and the band like that, right out of the truck? Night no, one? No, no, no. All those guys are from Indiana except one. Really? Every one of them are, are from your neck of the woods or my neck of the woods. And the only one that's not from Indiana is Andy, my guitar player. And uh, there was there's guys in the band that have been in the band for 50 years. So you, you introduced that gentleman 50 yeah, years. But, but he, the youngest guy in the band's been in the band 22 years. So, you know. Uh, it's almost code with us. Sure, but you, you announce the tour, you book the dates, then you go into rehearsal for a week, a weekend, two months, what do you do? I don't rehearse. <laughs> no. I, I, yeah. On the band, I'll, I'll put together a set list, and they'll, they'll work it up, I'll go in and say, let's change this, change that, change this, change that, change this, change that. Then they'll run it down, then I'll go back in. And then a couple of days before, I'll go in and sing the show, and I'll see if I think it works. But see, the advantage, you know, of having a long show is like that. When we started this tour, the show was two and a half hours. And what you saw last night was two hours. So we were able to, like, pare it down. It's much easier to cut down a show than, you know, oh, shit, let's add. we got to add some more songs. Then you got to learn them and all that stuff. So... The show is the show you saw last night is is the outcome of sixty some shows. And well, that song's not really working. Let's take it out. Okay, so this is, selection is uh, self-assigning in this case. But what what I was taken by many things I was taken by, and excuse this expression, I'm not allowed to use it really. The band seemed very tight, just really unbelievable. I mean, you couldn't take a breath without the band right there where you needed Well, and, and that's the advantage of, of working with people for a long time, you know, is, is that, you know, you have, you have, I have the ability to know that I can depend on these guys to do what, you know, what needs to be done, and they all know what their job is, they've all done it a million times, they've been through this a million times with me. So, and like Lisa, was in the band for 10 years, then she left for 20 some years, and this is her first tour back with us. 
and it's like Lisa is the violinist. Violinist, yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's just so nice to have her back. Not that the other violinist wasn't great; she was. But having Lisa's feel back on those records, I mean, on those songs that she recorded, uh, is fantastic. Yeah. It's fantastic. Um, now the other thing about last night, and then we'll move on. We go inside, there's a, a, a Gulfstream, not an Airstream trailer parked out there. Yeah. And I think, oh, the people are camping. <laughs> and uh, uh, somebody in your, in your group, and I won't reveal who, said, oh, no, that's, that's uh, Mr. Mellencamp. Uh, he goes in there and smoke. <laughs> you don't go in there and smoke. Oh, yeah, I smoke in there. Yeah. That's my dressing room. O outside on the, the sidewalk. Yeah, because I don't like, you know, one of the things I didn't like about playing arenas and outdoor venues, you would go in there and the night before, you know, some band would be in there and it would stink and, it, you know, I just couldn't go in those places anymore. And so I started dragging, that trailer, that airstream has been all over the world, Dave. It's a I beauty. Mean, and we ship it, you know, wherever the fuck I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I walk into that airstream and it's always the same. You, know, you don't sleep overnight in there. I sleep in the subways. <laughs> <laughs> I like to stay in contact with the people. <laughs> because what I saw last night was a tightly grouped, well-fed, brilliantly executing organism. Um, well, thank you for that. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and here's the part you didn't see, Dave. Kristen, what am I? What's the word? Oh, I love this. This is in the Times. Irascible rocker. Oh man, is that good? Yeah, well, that's the truth. Good. That's why they don't like me at sound check. Because sound checks, when I used to go to them, I'd show up at one, they'd be going, we're going to open the doors. It's seven o'clock. I'm still fucking yeah. going. Hey, that doesn't sound right. Let's go ahead and just on. And it just got to be ridiculous. So, so you're trouble in that regard. This sounds like it might be a little OCD. Am I onto something here? Like little OCD? <laughs> a lot of OCD. I mean, like, probably should be hospitalized. <laughs> I've also read, now that we're in this uh, area, uh, trouble by anxiety and hypochondria. Oh, okay. yeah. It's like I have a twin. <laughs> I'll tell you what Stephen King told me. It was really good. I said to Steve, I said, Steve, why in the fuck are we always sick? You know, why do we always feel, and he goes, John, we're creative people. You make up stories, I make up stories, and when we don't have anything to focus those stories on, we turn it on ourselves. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's like, once he said that to me, it, it kind of, I just kind of went, yeah, I just try it. I need to stay busy. I need to. I need to keep making stuff. I. I. I think I live an artist's life. I. Pre, I make something every day. And, yeah. And not so much because I think my work is so great or anything like that, but it's to keep my mind occupied from worrying about am I going to have another fucking heart attack? You know. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Anything. You know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anything. Yeah. Anything can can pop in your brain and all of a sudden it just takes over. I've been on stage this tour when I thought, I fucking had an heart attack. I'm gonna fucking die right here in front of the audience. And it's not funny. <laughs> it's scary. And, uh, and, and, but I always know deep in the back of my head that that's not really true, it's not really happening. This is, you're just making this up. Get focused, get back in the moment, get back in the moment. 
And so the show you saw last night, I was in the moment all, all evening. I didn't have any episodes like that. I, right now, I'm having a moment like that, and it happened just as soon as I came out and saw Costas. <laughs> I, I have known Bob for 30 years, and Bob is the most polite, nicest guy in the world. Now, what the fuck are you feeling? <laughs> Hey, Bob's a good guy. No, no, it, it's nothing Bob does. It's just what you describe. What? Be, being concerned about my own inadequacies in terms oh, of no, my health. Oh, Dave, 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 Dave. Let's, <laughs> let's talk about you for a second. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed, I don't know if any of you have noticed, but have you guys noticed how nighttime television is not as good without those? <laughs>
he beat the shit out of me. I mean, he beat me up so bad. So I was driving home in a Pinto, uh, an old Pinto, and I was leaning on the door like this, and the guy I was with is driving me going, God damn, man, you're all beat up. I go, I know, I know. And in Indiana, all the railroad tracks, you gotta go up over them because there's they built all the railroad tracks up so the railroads were running through there because there's quicksand underneath it. Did you know that? That's why there's skills on all of them. So anyway, we go over a railroad track. I fall out of the car. <laughs> My hair, which is this long, gets caught in the door. The thing that latches the door. And the guy I'm with is drunk and he's going, Hey, you're hanging outside the door? <laughs> I know! <laughs> I got up the next morning day and I was unrecognizable to myself. The orbits around my eyes were beat where this guy had beat me to death and I just said, John, this drug and alcohol thing is not working. <laughs> and I haven't touched drugs or alcohol. Yeah. Uh, I, I haven't had anything to drink since 83. It's, I have no story other than. <laughs> I didn't get a story. But don't you find life better without alcohol? I'm sorry, sir? Don't you find life better without alcohol? Oh, for, for the, the thing that I, I first experienced and was delighted by, you wake up, you don't have a hangover. <laughs> if I was accustomed to waiting, waking up because my lips were vibrating. <laughs> that was gone. And, I, I not, and I'm so much happier to be more in control than the alcohol was when it was in control. Well, I wrote one of my songs, I wrote it, said, I, there's a balance to life, I see it every time I swing by, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and you can't have that balance if you're from one extreme to the other, you know, you just, you just can't, so it's better to be a little, maybe, maybe a little self-conscious or bored, than it is to be like, ah, fuck, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, grow up, be responsible for yourself, yeah. don't, don't lean on a chemical. That's uh, right. Well, boy, you have poison. Don't lean on poison. Yeah. Because alcohol is poison. Yes. And everything that everything we put in our body, you know, is like, you know, the food we eat is poison. Yeah. Uh, now, speaking of punches, when you were 18, is it true that you punched your father? That was a mistake. <laughs> that was a big mistake. <laughs> Mix up? Uh, that was a guy, it was an oopsie doodle. <laughs> oopsie doodle. I was 17, and my dad caught me in a big lie. What was the lie, John? Uh, I told my dad that I was uh, going to Michigan with my girlfriend's family. But in reality, I was going over to a guy's house who was a school teacher who I smoked pot with, and we stayed stoned all weekend. But my dad saw me in the car, and when I got back home on Sunday night, he goes, "So how was Michigan?" And I go, "Fucking great." <laughs> he said, "Was it?" And I said, "Yeah." He go, and so he he quizzed me a couple times, and I kept lying to him. And finally he goes, God damn it, I saw you with what I don't know, chip. So I didn't know what to do. I was 17 years old, so I thought, well, fuck, I was going to punch him. <laughs> Here's what I didn't figure. Here's what I didn't figure. I was 17. He was 37. I thought he was an old man. <laughs> I didn't know he was in the prime of his life. <laughs> At 17, I thought he's my dad, he's an old man. I can take him. <laughs> no, he just said, You think you're a man now, huh? And I said, Yeah. And so that, that was about it. <laughs> is, there was an estrangement. Is that what set the estrangement off, or was that another issue? Uh, I, I don't know, Dave. I. On a very serious note, I never really cared what anybody, I didn't care what my parents thought. I, I, didn't, you know, I know a lot of people want to please their parents and they try to like, do what their parents want to do. I, I always just never cared. I, you know, they would say, stand up, I'd sit down. I mean, that was the way it was. You know, I grew up, uh, 
you know, not really uh, paying much attention to the rules at school or the rules that were at the house. I just kind of did what the fuck I wanted to do and tried not to get caught. Yeah. And where did that get you? On this stage with you. <laughs> to uh, other things. But then, one of the great moments of your life was when you were 23, involving your father. Yeah, how did you know that story? I, I think Bob knew that. <laughs> <laughs> did you cover this stuff with him? No. Oh, oh sorry. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Bob and I were talking about eyebrow stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, your dad, there was a stranger. Your dad looks. Yeah, you know, I just, I just made a point never to be around the old man. You know, there were five kids in our family. My dad was very uh, ambitious. That's, you know, he was a young man. He was ambitious. My mom was a beautiful woman. And then I should probably should have said this, but I'm going to. In the seventies, they handed out hysterectomies to women. Anytime there was anything wrong. Oh, she gave you a straight thing. My mom went in, a lovely, loving mother came back a fucking lunatic. <laughs> because there was no, they had no uh, medicine, you know, to take wow. care. Yeah, so they 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 just gave the hysterectomies out. You got female problems? Hysterectomy. So anyway, uh, I made a point of staying away from her because it was like she was always, she went that way when I was a little kid. She was a real loving mother when I was little, but with five kids. And then dad, you know, it was, it was like, he didn't like hippie stuff. He didn't like loud music. And, and he just didn't like me and I didn't like him. And so anyway, what Dave's referring to is, is that one day I, after I got a record deal, like, you know, I, I was anti everything, material things, Cars. I was against all that shit. All I needed was a guitar, a motorcycle, a little change jingling around my pocket, stereo. I was in good shape. Dad had a Jaguar, and he always wore these fucking Armani suits and shit. He was like, fuck off. And anyway, uh, he called me up one day. I hadn't spoken to him for two years. Well, because I got married when I was still in high school, and I didn't tell him. And I had a kid, I didn't tell. So, <laughs> so anyway, he wasn't happy about that. <laughs> and my mom wasn't happy about me either. So, um, Dad and I did talk for a couple of years, and uh, it was a good two years. Um, uh, and then I got a call from him one day, and he said, uh, well, you have lunch with me in Nashville, Indiana. And you know, I know where that is, yep. There you go. In we, Brown County. Yep, we know where that's at. And I said, why? Well, he goes, well, I'd like to talk to you. And I go, Dad, we're going to talk to you. He says, yeah, I think we do. And I go, Dad, I'm not coming. He goes, John, please. So I drive <coughs> over to Nashville, which is, I lived in Bloomington, which was about, I don't know, 10, 20 minutes away. My dad was already there. We were at some hotel, restaurant. We sat down and he's got his suit on and I saw his car sitting out there and I thought. So anyway, I go in and he's, he's very being very businesslike, very polite. Then listen to this, you guys. My fucking dad, who presented himself as a badass his whole life to me. Gotta do this, you gotta do that, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. Gets out of the booth and gets down on one knee right here beside me and with tears in his eyes he said John I don't know what I've done or cause you to dislike me so much but whatever I've done I'm asking for your forgiveness and if you forgive me I promise you we will never have another problem and since that day we have not one word of problem at all. And Dad turned 93.
screen the other day. And two questions related to this. One, do you know what flipped the switch for your father to make that move? Uh, yeah, but it's too long to go into. Uh, it had to do with his business. My dad retired at 48. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I've learned from dad, I'll pass it on to you, I'm sure you already know it. My dad is 93 years old and he's busier than you and I put together. Good for him. He's, we're always going someplace, doing something. He's in Nashville, he's at the 500, he's uh, in Chicago, he's busy, 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 busy all the fucking time. Now, up until that moment, you, you mentioned that you didn't think about your family, didn't care about your family. Um, this episode must have helped you being a father. Well, I was awfully young to be a father. You know, I thought raising a kid, you know, when you're 18 years old and you have a kid. Well, going through life. Uh, when, you're, when you have a kid at that age, you know, you think good parenting is throwing water balloons at the kid. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, I'll show you one of my kids. Justice, where are you? Justice, stand up. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, there are probably times that she would like to. She has a funny story about. Look at it, look at it. Oh, you're being edited here, that's lovely. <laughs> she was about how old have you, honey? She was 16 years old. I had a house on Milton Bed. You know where Milton Bed's at, right? Yes, I know of it, sure. <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, I had a house on the bunk ramp. And uh, I go downstairs and I notice, I don't drink, but I notice some beer bottles. It's like, what the fuck are these beer bottles? <laughs> so I go, Justice. Justice was the only kid around. But my wife didn't drink, I didn't drink. I had two little boys who were three and four, and they didn't drink. <laughs> so, so I knew it had to be her. Yes. That's the suction. That's the I said, what's the deal here? And she said, Dad, I'm like, and tell them what happened to you. He took away my birthday. Took away your birthday? Oh my goodness, at 16. And what did you have to do on your birthday? It's kind of an upscale, upscale punishment. <laughs> But the, the part of the show where, where uh, you have recorded Judge Woodward reading your songs, it, which reinforces in my head the notion that this stuff is poetry. So you have her reading lyrics to a song. Uh, and I, think, I just thought that was a, a wonderful touch in the evening. But anyway, this is, uh, this is uh, and you claim not to read uh, reviews. Uh, good or bad, you don't read them, is that true? I have people will tell me about it. Yes, that, well, I, that's I fair enough. Yeah. This is, I think, from the recent tour. Uh, this is from the Dallas Observer. Anybody here from the Dallas Observer? <laughs> I 
Are you working with the observer? <laughs> no, but he knows about it. Uh, he knows what year it was started. What year was it, Bob? 1916. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, quoting you in, in the review of the show, this is, this is John saying, this is the acoustic part of the set. If you're one of the people screaming in the quiet parts before, please go outside, John says. This is the quiet part, so keep your fucking mouth shut. <laughs> Within seconds, a woman in the crowd yelled out, John! To which she replied, what did I just fucking say? <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> Well, see, I was still feeling how, how to deal with that. This was beautiful. The, 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 how to deal with the quiet section. So, what I learned was, is like, the audience is standing, and, and I go, okay, everybody sit down, and I say, now I'm going to tell some stories. And they sit down, and I don't have to tell them to shut the fuck up. <laughs> I mean, it's much, it's much wider. Yes. I didn't mind them to shut the fuck up, but... <laughs> But the basic dynamic of people paying money to see you and then being told to shut the fuck up. Here's where you're wrong, Dave. Here's where you're wrong. When you did your show, if you had some motherfucker out there yelling at you, what would happen to that guy? Well, I would drop to my knees and sob. No, no, that no, guy. That, we, we had people that would wrestle him out of there. Yeah, yeah. Of but course. The, the more elegant way is how you handle it. <laughs> no, no. And, and, you know, if you go to Broadway, you're not allowed to get up and fuck right. or yell. Right. You're right. You're right. You're, right. You're, you're not. Allowed, you know, I don't know what's happened. You know, the, every, they say everything comes around is in a circle. I'll be glad in civility and kindness and understanding. <laughs> Uh, I, I want to talk about, uh, I mean, there's so many things to talk about, and don't let me forget to talk about other things, all right? <laughs> okay, we got things and things. Yeah, okay. We have things that we got to cover and things we got to cover. Uh, the, the, the songwriting of it all, and I recently read, and I, I was oblivious to this, forgive me, uh, Little Pink Houses. Uh, I believed, uh, because I listened to it and assumed it was a, a salute to the American way of life. The, the salute, a salute to the American dream. Uh, and now you have explained, and I recognize now, that it's just the opposite. Yeah, yeah it's always been the opposite. Uh, always been the opposite. So does, does this mean one needs to take a look at the entire uh, catalog of your material and uh, refocus? I'm not for everybody, Dave. <laughs> and, I, and I have never been for everybody. It's just that my strong suit is not lyrical content, but I, I write good melodies. Well, see, I would differ with you on the lyrical content. The, the, the Joan Woodward thing is an example. This stuff is poetry. Well, th thank you, but at the same time, I think that I can make a melody anytime I want. I can whistle it, like, and I can... Oh, you can whistle. Yeah. <laughs> so you go. <laughs> <laughs> Dance, whistle, do the whole thing. And this is a question I've asked others in your line of work. You, you get an idea, like, uh, oh yeah, life goes on long before the thrill of living is gone. Now, how old were you when you wrote that lyric? <coughs> um, 27. How did, you, how did you know this at 27? I, because kids are selfish and short-sighted. How did you know this? Because I was a kid and self-sighted. It's a short sighted. Yeah, but it, what you, what you, it applies, and you must feel that lyric now more than uh, words in a song. Actually, I don't. Uh, I feel that life is short even in its longest stage. There's a song right there. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I don't know if you ever had this moment, and I don't know about people know it's last since as I did. You, you guys must have all. But did you ever just think, God damn, there's got to be more to life than this. There has got to be more than life than this. I'm successful, I'm selling records, I got a little bit of money, uh, I can play anywhere I want, I'm still not satisfied. 
And then all of a sudden one day I woke up and went, you know, there's no more to it than this. This is it. And once I made that discovery inside myself, life got a little bit easier. It's well, how old were you when this came to you? It was two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe two. But I, I heard you say, or read someplace, I heard you say this, that you can see the finish line. Can't you? Oh, I, I'm in overtime, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 let me tell you something. The average A, talk about guys in rock bands, the average, the life expectancy for a guy in a rock band is 49. 49 years old. For guys like me and you, it's seven and Bob. <laughs> Don't forget about Bob. <laughs> Bob and I are the same age. Uh, so that makes you the old guy. You know? yep. So if you're joining the band, if you're joining the what's it called? If you're joining the Swell Boys, uh, then you're going to have to be the old guy. Uh, is 78, Bob? The life expectancy? Yeah. If you say so. Just <laughs> because I say so, it's true. I'm the, no. big, I'm the biggest fucking liar in this room. I'm I'm a songwriter, that's what we do, we make up lies. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'm supposed to be reassured by this? <laughs> yeah. Um, but see, I. I I've studied you now for for this uh, this evening, and it's been a wonderful experience. But because I think it was sort of a surface awareness of you, and you'd been on the show, and I knew you and my mother, and uh, had a dinner and stuff. Uh, <laughs> and, and then I thought, well, let's take a look at just what you're talking about. You you you've done this. You have a family. You have five kids, eight, nine grandkids. You you are you have the energy and the intelligence to put on. A, an amazing musical experience last night. You, you've one of the founders of farming. I mean, come on. <laughs> and I want to know about that because that organization has been around nearly 50 years. It has been, no, almost 50 years. Yeah. Hey, you are talking to the luckiest guy you've ever spoke to. Right, but the, the, the farming thing, and let's, let's figure that out. That wasn't luck. I was born with spina bifida. I had a fucking bullet in my neck and a growth on the back of my head as big as a man's fist on a baby's head. At Riley's Children's Hospital, there were four other kids with spina bifida. In 1951, when they operated pinking shears and screwdrivers. Oh my God. And there was a young doctor named Heinberger who was a young doctor, and he said, we can't just let these kids slay you if they're going to fucking die. Because if you have that, you become hydrocephalic, which means you have the things. So the guy said, I'm going to operate on all these kids. Every one of those kids died, except me. Every fucking one of them. I didn't even know that I had had that operation until I was 11. And some kid goes, no one can't put some big scar in the back of your hand. I don't know. I went home and asked my parents. I said, let's just pick out a hand here. And went, oh, yeah, there's a huge scar in the back of my neck. It's still there. Uh, and uh, it turns out that uh, Dr. Heinberger, uh, I saw him right before he died. He lived to be 100. And, you know, I was one of the first successful operations of that kind on a kid, Dave, luck is thinking you're lucky. And I've always thought I was lucky. Yes. And, and the luck is you could have gone on and did go on to lead a successful life. Beyond that, you answered the need of American farmers and put together an organization a program that is still viable and vigorous. Well, I would like. Later. I just like. To so take, I understand what you're saying, but they're not necessarily connected. I I would like to take a lot of credit for farming, but I can't really because uh, uh, Willie is really in charge of farming, and Neil and I are really just soldiers. And you know, I we've done. I don't know. I don't know how 
It started in 85. How many years is that? Like I said, I think we're looking at 50 here. Yeah. So a lot of years, Willie just turned 90. So I was a kid. Willie was a kid. You know, and we were so naive, Dave, that we thought, me, Willie, and Neil thought, we'll go in this concert, we'll get all these people. And it was the time when everybody was doing, you know, these concerts for, you know, for whatever. And, and most of them didn't last, and most of them were, in my opinion, phony. Uh, like, let, let's clean off the statue with it. Co sponsored by Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> Coca-Cola's got our best interest at heart. They <laughs> care about freedom. <laughs> anyway, so, but, we were a bunch of young guys, and we were so naive that we thought we'd put this concert, and the Senate would go, hey, these guys are making good points. And then Willie and I went to a Senate subcommittee, and when the bill came up that we came to talk about, half the fucking Senate subcommittee just got up and walked out. And there were a couple guys, Willie said a few things, I said a few things, and then some fucking senator goes, did you guys bring your guitars? And I looked at Willie and I said, I don't know about you, but I'm getting the fuck out of here. Fuck these guys. And I got up and left. And that's what he said. <laughs> so Willie answered a few more questions. And then, uh, so Willie really should get a Nobel Peace Prize for. Uh, for uh, Still, in all, I, again, you're minimizing uh, your participation in this, and the fact that after nearly 50 years, it's still uh, serving the purpose it was designed to fill. Uh, and what did it, what was the, what was the money used for, what is it used for today? Is it still the same issue, still the same cause? Well, yeah, I think Willie basically buys pot with it. I, <laughs> I said, I think basically Willie just buys pot with it. I, no, what happens is, Generally, the money is given to farmers who are in crisis. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how you would feel if you grew up on a farm and then it was given to you and then you weren't able to sustain. But you guys, I know you don't know about farming, I mean, you probably care. But the government is against small family farming. They're for, you know, the big, big agricultural places. And so the laws are really written to substantiate a big ag, and they don't give a fuck about black farmers, they don't care about small family farms, they, they don't give a shit. Everything is about big ag, big this, big that, and that's what our government does. And we thought, we were so naive, we'll do this concert and they'll change the way. <laughs> that ain't give a shit. Well, uh, I, uh, you, you should, email everybody everything you know about this because it's far more complicated and what you have done is, is far more, um, uh, it saved uh, people. No, saved but listen, listen, I'm, I'm not going to short sell that, that Farm Aid has helped people. I'm yeah, but like you said, many of these programs, these big concert affairs have gone by the wayside. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, back then, it was like, you know, uh, I was asked to do, I don't know, Live Aid or some shit like that, and, uh, <laughs> and I, I said yes. I was asked to do the US Festival, and I said yes. And then I, you start looking behind the mirror or the curtain, and you go, what? At the at at the US Festival, it was they sprung on us at the last moment. Oh, oh, by the way, we're going to film the whole thing. Ooh. Wait a minute, I thought we were just playing a lot of time. You're going to film it and then you're going to sell the film? What's going to happen with that fucking money? Where's that money going? And then with the other one, you know, it, it, the guy had his best foot forward, but then television got involved and it became a worldwide thing. And people were actually fighting each other if they were going to be on prime time time. Mm -hmm. You know, and I heard that. And I went, because my manager was going, well, you know, you got to really, and I go, I'm not doing that shit. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to be involved in that. Uh, we're filming this. <laughs>
Let me uh, sadly we're, we're out of time. Let me just take a look here and see. If, is anything you want to cover before we go here? Um, not really, Dave. Uh, other than uh, oh, oh, Orpheus I, I, descending. Orpheus descending. I was uh, listening to that and eyes of Portland on that beautiful and uh, understated understated uh, reverence. Reverence. Holy, what a lovely song that is. Can you tell me what that means to you, and, and I will know what I think it means to me? Well, now, Orpheus Descending, where, where, why is that applicable in your life for this music? Orpheus Descending was uh, uh, the original title for The Fusion of Kind, which was written by Tennessee Williams. Orpheus Descending was the play in 1955 or something. And nobody knew that name. I, I knew it. Mm -hmm. or Orpheus is a, a Greek god. Greek god. The was, son of Apollo. Uh, yeah, and he was a singer and he was handsome. Yeah. And he went down to Hades to get his girlfriend back. And they said, don't look back. If you do, then she's going to stay here with me with the devil. And he looked back. Mm -hmm. And so that, that I was like, hell, that Yeah. <laughs> and, and then what was the other thing? <laughs> uh, oh no, the, the song, uh, un Understated Reverence. It's such a beautiful song. Well, here's, I hate to say it in front of you or anybody, but most of these songs, I don't know what the fuck they're talking about. <laughs> I, I just don't. Way to sell the records. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, here's what happens. Listen. You, 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 you've written jokes. You, you, you've written jokes. Did you hear the one about a melon camp that I used to go to? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I hate to say it, Dave, but I've been hearing that joke since I was. I, 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 okay, I'm sorry. Listen, uh, God dang, as we might say, and, and getting to know you has been a great pleasure, and the music. Good heavens, it will outlive us all. Thank you, Dave. John Mellon,